Yeah, welcome, hello, welcome back, welcome back to the Clark and Miller English Podcast. If this is your first time here, then just welcome, not welcome back. You get welcome back next time. So, um, yeah, thanks uh, for all the new subscribers uh, coming in, growing steadily and surely, and it's great to, 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 to hear that, you know, this is this podcast is helping people and people have generally seem happy about it but you know if you're not happy about it also you should send me an email anyway uh today will be fun uh we have got an excellent interview um with lawrence weinstein uh he's an ex-harvard professor um, you know, Harvard, the famous university in America with a big statue of a man whom you kind of touch his shoe and you get good luck. Um, yeah, so Lawrence was a joy to talk to. Fantastic uh, a, a guy, really interesting angle on, on language and grammar. And I'm not going to talk too much about it right now, except I'm going to talk a bit about it right now, to be fair. Um, because, yeah, Lawrence has written a really interesting book called Grammar and a Full Life, How the Ways We Shape a Sentence Can Limit or Enlarge Us. This is Lawrence's new book. Uh, it has a very interesting way of looking at language, and it's a sort of connection between language and wellness and psychology and how we can make ourselves better people and and happier people through grammar. Crazy idea, right? That's why I liked it. Um, he has these great chapter titles, things like tapping inborn energy transitive verbs in the active voice, or getting out of one's way passive voice, or generosity, semicolons and cumulative sentences. And well, you get the idea. Uh, we talked about all these um, ideas behind uh, a selection of his chapters, but we also got into more interest, like other interesting areas about how passive tenses aren't always completely reversible, how the future doesn't really exist in English, and loads of cool stuff, and you are about to listen to all of that. But first, I've decided to introduce a new section of the podcast, and we're going to have a quiz section. Um, yeah, I thought it'd be fun if we could all, instead of just listening to me all the time, you get to interact with with me and with the podcast and hopefully hear your name on the podcast. But there's more. I want to uh, open a conversation about interesting topics about language and language learning. And I've decided we're going to do a quiz every episode and I'm going to ask a question and the and then send me in your answers. These are not yes or no, right or wrong questions. These are just ideas and open questions. And I will choose the, the one I like most, the, the answer I, I, my favorite answer from, from the lot of them. And the person who gives me my favorite answer will win a free copy of my e our ebook, 102 Little Drawings That Will Help You Remember English Rules Forever. Uh, 102 Little Drawings That Will Help You Remember English Rules Forever. It's uh, our ebook, our Clark and Miller ebook. Um, yeah, and you get a free copy. Uh, if you write in the best answer to the question, which I'm about to ask in a minute. Uh, it's a free electronic copy and it'll save you it'll save you ten dollars, ten bucks. So why 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 not save yourself ten bucks? Write in an answer to the question which I still haven't asked and I'm about to. And um yeah, and uh you might get a free copy and sa save yourself ten bucks. Why not? Okay, so today we're going to have a question uh, related to learning strategies, learning language learning strategies. So, you know, we have a lot of listeners and they come from lots of different places. We have English learners, we have English teachers, we have people who are teaching and learning English, and we also have people who are just interested in language. But I bet my right shoe that even people who are not technically English learners or English 
teachers are still language learners, are still learning another language. So I think I'm basically covering almost all our listeners here, um, assuming that we're all interested in learning strategies, language learning strategies. So here is the question. I am finally asking it. Here it comes without further delay, without any more ado. The question is this. What is your favorite l- I can't even say the question. I've been building it up and I just ruined that. Anyway, I'll probably keep that in because that's the sort of thing I do. What is your favorite listening strategy, your language listening strategy? How do you listen? um, uh, How do you practice your listening? How do you improve your listening skills? Listening is tough. Listening is difficult. Do you just listen to lots of stuff or do you focus on the small segments and listen over and over again? Do you get transcripts and subtitles or do you just go in completely raw? How do you develop your listening? For the most interesting answer, I will give that person a copy of 102 little drawings that will help you remember English rules forever for free. Save yourself 10 bucks. So uh, how do you submit? It's very easy. Um, If you want to answer this question, just send me an email at, well, I'm going to give the at later. Just send me an email, gabriel at clarkandmiller.com. Gabriel, G-A-B-R-I-E-L, gabriel at clarkandmiller.com. Clark like Clark Kent, Miller like the beer. And we'll check out the answers and the winner next episode. Okay, that was the quiz. I've talked about Larry, Lawrence, Mr. Weinstein. Um, Let's start the interview and just start listening. So I hope you enjoy this and I'm looking forward to those answers for the quiz. All right, off we go. So welcome, welcome, Larry. So thanks for uh, joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah it's great to have you here. Um, I'm going to just quickly introduce you. Uh, I'm virtually sitting here with uh, Lawrence Weinstein. Uh, he taught at Harvard between 1973 and 1983. Um and he was in charge of the expository writing course. And expository, expos- <laughs> I could, I always have tr- tr- trouble with this word. Expository writing theory and writing practice course. Is that right? That's right. That was one of the ways a Harvard student could satisfy the writing requirement back in those days. And, uh, I was in charge of that particular course. Okay. Yeah. What is expository writing? I mean, I, ch- I had a, I had a quick look online, but, could you could you outline what it means? Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, writing that explains or persuades mm. uh, w- without recourse to uh, fiction. <laughs> because <laughs> okay. of course, fiction can also persuade, but by other means. Right. Yeah. Great. Okay, that's cool. That's that's clear, and that kind of matches into your book. Um, Somewhat, doesn't it? Yes. There's a sort of a link there somehow. Um, okay. And um, you now, well, Larry now works in the English department at Bentley College in I'm Massachusetts. Retired. Ah, I'm retired. I have out yeah. of date information. My apologies. Um, yeah. <laughs> Larry was <laughs> working in the English department at Bentley. Um, and he also wrote uh, a bestseller, uh, Writing at the Threshold, uh, which was a book on writing instruction at high school and university in 2001. That was a bestseller of the National Council of Teachers of English, yes. Fantastic. Oh, that's yeah. great. And um, and also some plays. Uh, Larry's also a playwright. Right. Um, I'm getting all this right, aren't I? So yes, far? you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, doing well. Okay, great. Um, Curtains for Macbeth was a finalist uh, at the UK International Playwriting Festival. Yes. And most relevant to our chat today, uh, Grammar and a Full Life uh, was published just last week. Is that right? A week ago. Grammar for a Full Life. For a, excuse me. Grammar for a Full Life. Sure. Last week. Yeah. Yes, last week. Yeah. How's it, how's it all going? How was the launch and everything? How was... It's been it's been really a, a, a good launch. Uh, we've already sold a few hundred copies, and oh, that's uh, I I was pleased. 
That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, it, it comes with high praise, doesn't it? Does, Lynn Truss, um, of all people, has has also uh, read it and and commented right. on it, right? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. I'm really glad to hear it's doing well. It should do well because it is a good book. And yeah, lots of like really interesting and sort of original ideas um, about it. And we're going to we're going to look in. I'd, I'd like to dive into certain parts <clears throat> of the book, if that's all right with you, that really like caught my attention. Sure. Um, but before we do that, can I ask you what got you into language? What inspired you? How did you end up becoming a language person? Oh my. I I've often wondered about that and I'm still in the process of exploring that in my own mm. mind. Uh words were a source of great uh anxiety and humi- humiliation for me early in life. I was always assigned to a lower reading group in the <laughs> first grade and the second grade and didn't really break the code didn't really begin to read Mm -hmm. with anything approaching fluency until I was maybe 10 years old, Mm -hmm. uh, well well behind my peers. Um, Even though I knew that verbal proficiency, being able to present myself well, mattered a lot uh, to my father especially. So there Mm -hmm. was a lot of anxiety (laughs) <laughs> attached to words and then at, I think it's some I, I'm, I'm, this is a work in progress by the way I don't really know the reasons but this is what I'm telling myself right now these days um, at some point I realized that the thing about writing was you could put it down and you didn't have to present it to the world straight off as soon as it came to you You could let it sit. You could work it and rework it until it was something that seemed passable, at least. Uh, And I think in my, you know, nine, ten year old mind, there was a lot of advantage to that, to writing. Uh, And then at some point in time, my father, who was an immigrant, who was not himself a fluent speaker of English, uh, had me start to help him. Uh, to check his, all his business correspondence mm-hmm. for grammar. And I can remember doing that on Saturday mornings with him. But I realized this was not mechanical for him. He mm-hmm. was actually a very expressive man. And when he inserted a colon, he, he had a reason to. He was demanding <laughs> attention. So I think that was... I think that those were among the uh, among the roots of my uh, interest in writing, in writing uh, for expression. There's a lot more I could say about mm-hmm. that. Some of it. So your 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 father's semicolons jumped out at you. Colons. Oh, just the colons. Oh, um, okay. This my my father was someone who demanded attention and used a mark of punctuation to mm. obtain it. <laughs> that okay. Really, that really, uh, <laughs> uh, I noticed that. Okay. And was that yeah. maybe the the spark? You know, you 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 saw how the colon could be so powerful, and um, you you started thinking more about language from this sort of point. Oh my! <laughs> You're getting me to say more than I expected to. There, there was That's something else right. happening too, which I can't begin to explain. Okay. It, okay. That this didn't start until perhaps eighth grade, mm-hmm. and I had Mrs. Calloway for English. Do you remember her? I remember her from the book. Yeah, she she wasn't very keen on your your work <laughs> at the time. But, but Mrs. Calloway was the first uh, teacher I had to assign Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. We read Julius Caesar. Okay, and I was very, very smitten. Uh, and I, who was someone who never walked into the public library, never. Uh, that summer after eighth grade, walked into my local library to find out if this guy had written anything else. <laughs> I had liked Julius <laughs> Caesar so well, and it turned out, and the librarian mm. took me to a shelf, and it turned out he'd written a lot. <laughs> He's got a few numbers, yeah. <laughs> he'd written a lot. So then I was 
overwhelmed, <laughs> and I looked along the shelf for the thinnest volume, the one that mm. would probably be the most manageable, and that was a play called Macbeth. Okay. And I and I took it home, and I I still I know exactly where I sat in my house to to read it. I knew I was only I can tell you. Quite honestly, I was only getting every third word, mm-hmm. and I could not uh, remove my eyes from the page. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even with a 30% yes, comprehension level. Was, I knew something was happening now that I had not seen happen with language before. So I, 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 I should stop right there, but those mm-hmm. were among the... That's that's great. Yeah, no, that's a great way as well to to discover the beauty of of how you can make language beautiful with Shakespeare because he was so good at that. Obviously, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about the book. I mean, how do you describe your book? Uh, how do you describe grammar for a full life um, when you're describing it to people in a nutshell? that it's a book where you can learn more about grammar than you may already have known and discover uh, the relationship between language and uh, identity Mm -hmm. or personality, who you are. Mm -hmm. Uh, And beyond that, perhaps contemplate some suggestions I make in the course of the book for using language to expand as a person. Yeah. So it's a it's a sort of a multi-purpose type of a product. I got that yeah. feeling as well. I I felt at times that it was um, it's sort of um, hang on, I've got this down somewhere. Yes, like a it was a mixture of like what the title says, using grammar for life, and you got your subtitles: how the ways we shape a sentence can limit or enlarge us. Right. So yeah, I felt there was that sort of direction going on a lot. You know how we can um improve ourselves i suppose or or become fuller um right. through grammar right. but right. also i i found that sometimes it was it was doing sort of going in the opposite direction as well and showing how we can make sense of the world with the filter of grammar and using huh. grammar as a filter to kind of comprehend the vast complicated messy world we live in ah oh, yeah uh, in the sense of, uh, I'm just, I, I, I'm not sure I, 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 I'm, I'm going to be saying what you just said, but I'm, <laughs> this is my take on what you just okay. said. That breaking one's life experience into these categories, in a way, yes, it simplifies life, but it also clarifies. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it can make one more aware of the pieces at, at, at work. Uh, that mm-hmm. uh, comprise a full life. Is mm-hmm. that? Is yes, that a fair uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's that. That qualifies it well, I think, because it it doesn't it doesn't remove any of it doesn't pretend the world's simple. I I I, I think you totally yeah you nailed it there. Yeah, but there's a sort of way of understanding. It helps you helps you understand things. Yeah, I'm glad but, to hear that. Yeah, yeah I, I really liked it. And um, I one thing when I got the when I got it and I started skimming it um. That some of the, the, the titles, the chapter titles really enticed me. Uh, we've got things like tapping inborn energy, transitive verbs in the active voice, um, uh, a defense of correctness, apostrophes, um, <laughs> <laughs> generosity, semicolons, and cumulative sentences. I've got one more that I marked out. Yeah. A hedge against preoccupation, the future tense and adverbial provisos i always get that word from provisos um really really cool and you know if if you've read my blog like i love i love these sorts of um looking at language from from sort of different points of view different angles because there's a million ways we can look at look at language and and it's it's great and this is just such an original original um approach well thank Um, you yeah that's fantastic so anyway um Let's um, let's look at. I'd, I'd like to just dive into a few chapters. Um, sure. I really like the second uh, chapter, tapping inborn energy, transitive verbs in the active voice. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I'd summarize the whole thing by just saying, take control. 
<laughs> by <laughs> by yeah. by using the active voice. But would you like to describe that a little a little more and the ideas behind that? Uh, well, yes, I. This is hardly original to me. This that particular chapter, I just tried to write it up in my way. Uh, but it's something that you find uh, addressed in in uh, uh, Orwell's George Orwell's essay politics in the English language I was going to bring and, that up <laughs> uh, were you yeah. but for a different yeah. chapter <laughs> yes you find it addressed in different at different I, I, I think here is the here he, I, I'm getting back to what is the difference between mm-hmm. me and Orwell here mm-hmm. uh, we both care about the active voice his interest goes a lot more to the problem of human accountability. Mm-hmm. Who can be held responsible for what horrendous acts of political leaders and so forth? Mm-hmm. Um, how are they managing language to avoid responsibility? And that's important. And I, I talk a little about that in the book. What he does not talk about so much is what the active voice does for the speaker, Mm -hmm. uh, him or herself. Uh, I think your word control is very important here. Mm -hmm. It helps a person to stay in control. Mm -hmm. I am not a mere victim in this world Mm -hmm. going through life. I, too, within certain limits, and there are real limits out there, within certain limits, I am the master of my destiny, and I I have to at least uh, to retain agency. I mm-hmm. have to operate from that assumption much of the time. Yeah, yeah. I like the yeah. examples. Um, uh, you've, <laughs> instead of being I've, I've been put on hold for ten minutes, you've got I've been holding for ten minutes. Right. Now to me, that's. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Let me go on. To me, that there's a profound difference between mm-hmm. those two. Yeah, yeah. That's, I was yeah, I was going to say like you can really feel it, can't you? You just have so much more control in that second sentence. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, right. And agency, I love that word because it's all about agency and and right. Yeah, being in control. You can always hang up, right? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but you can if you don't use the right language in your own head, you won't hang up. You won't think that you have that ability yeah yeah so i thought that was quite a powerful chapter um moving on i liked uh, the third one too uh, the wherewithal i liked all of them but particularly um (laughs) the third one the wherewithal certain prepositions um and it's a similar thing isn't it it's about um taking control and sort of empowering yourself a little um i could talk about it but i'm sure you you could do it. Uh, you could go ahead and yeah. Could you? Sorry. Yeah. Could you? Um, well, I'm just. It's, it's 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 a it's a short chapter just to make the point mm-hmm. that if we develop eyes for how someone is performing an act mm-hmm. that may leave us awestruck, like mm-hmm. diving into a a pool without splashing, without displacing the water. Uh, if we just get into that linguistic habit of embedding into our reports of such acts that we observe, the how of it, yeah. how, what did we see happen or what did we learn from asking about how it happened and embed that in our discourse, in our way of reporting to others what we saw, we will ourselves be more, we be better oriented to doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. How did she do that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, right. yeah, we've got the, the, the buys and the throughs, right? That's right. I liked your, the, uh, you had two examples. Um, by the way, on this note, uh, I think my new favorite word um, at the moment is splashlessly, which was, <laughs> was in this example. It's such a beautiful word. Splashlessly. Okay. She, she dived into the water splashlessly. Um, but the other example you had was uh, somebody cutting onions without yes. crying. And yeah, if you just say he can cut onions without crying, you're marveling and you have no sort of power in, in being able to do that. But if you say he's, he, what was it? He's, he's cutting onions without crying by, was it holding his breath? Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, I try. I tried it though; it didn't work. <laughs> but, it, it, the, the 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 truth is, it it, it doesn't work for all people. Okay. It, it, it it works for me. Oh, that's uh, it, it. But I know that. I, I could have gone into more detail there, but I thought it would be a distraction. <laughs> I, I hope people don't think it's a universal cure. Oh. There are other ways of <laughs> keeping from crying <laughs> when you're cooking. Yeah. You, 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 yes, you can, you can actually put put the uh, if you'd like to know, you can put the onion into your freezer for half an hour before cutting. I've heard that and, one too. Yeah. Oh, you've heard that one too. That's a good one, though. I think it works, but you have to have have a lot of foresight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, at least half an hour's worth. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah. I keep. No, um, I, I, you're right about that. Oh no, yeah. I mean, it's just a by the by. It's it's totally yeah. Yeah. beside the point anyway. But um, um, yeah. I keep I keep swimming goggles in my kitchen for for onion cutting. <laughs> oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. It's just. I would never have thought of that. That's <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> I'm surprised not everyone does it, but it did take me what 37 years or so to to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> that, but that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. That's a great idea. That never occurred to me. Brilliant. Yeah. Try it out. If you if you've forgotten to put in the in the freezer and you feel like breathing when you're cutting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um cool, yeah. Uh chapter six. I like chapter six a lot too. Um it's a very simple again, it's a very simple chapter, isn't it? It's the, sorry, it's the no effort without error cross outs. Right. Yeah. Right, right. And yeah, would you like to outline this uh, the 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 ideas in this well, one? There are there are far too many people uh, in the world who write themselves off prematurely, uh, doing whatever it is they're attempting uh, to, to do. Uh, that could be to you know, dive into a pool splashlessly, or or to or to have a love life. And they, they, they think they're just no good at it without getting it that, um, it, error is built into the human project. It's, we don't, we don't just come born knowing, you know, how to yep. uh, uh, write a, a good sonata or anything. Uh, we have trial and error is unavoidable and, uh, what distinguishes, yes, there, there is such a thing as having more ability at something than someone else has. Mm -hmm. But what else distinguishes one person from the next is how much tolerance they possess for mistake making. Yeah. And their ways of construing mistakes as steps forward rather than signs of uh, inability. That's what that chapter is yeah. about. And, and of course, when you write, uh, ideally you learn that, the power of revision. Mm -hmm. So to become a reviser, and especially an adept reviser, is a way to get that into your own uh, consciousness. The necessity to put something down there, call it a draft, even if, we're, even if it's not about writing, mm -hmm. and then revisit it and revisit it. And revisit it until it comes closer and closer to what uh, you're after. Mm -hmm. That's what the chapter is about. And yeah, and it rings very true to me uh, as an English teacher. You know, a lot of our listeners are, are English language learners. Um, and oh. it's just something I tell my students and listeners and readers or whoever I can, <laughs> whoever I can tell. Um, you have to make mistakes to learn. It's so important. Right. It's so important. Right. And this transfers beautifully onto other things like language learning, I think. We had um, on the podcast um, a few weeks ago, um, Lindsay from Lindsay Does Languages. She's a polyglot. And uh -huh. she, she, it reminds me of something she told me. Um, most people have sort of goals you know, like um, saying five things correctly in a conversation or something like that. But she has mistake goals. She says, like, I'm not going to finish this conversation until I've made five mistakes. Oh, that's that's beautiful. <laughs> Isn't it that's nice? That's beautiful. I yeah. would have liked to be able to quote her in the chapter. Oh, There's always <laughs> a second edition. <laughs> that's very much my spirit in the chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah uh, no, it that. totally reminded me of, of what she yeah. said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's it. Everyone, make mistakes. It's good for you. Yes. Um, okay, here we go. We're getting, we're getting, getting into the, the crooks of things here because we've got the one on the passive. Um, 
getting out of one's way, the passive. Yes. It's such a fascinating beast, isn't it? The passive and the whole active passive dichot- dichotomy as well. Um, I, yeah, uh, would you like to summarize the chapter? I, I'm going to let you do it in your own words rather than summarize it for you. Well, we're in a, uh, we're in a bind here mm-hmm. in English. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I don't know enough about other languages to know if this is true of all languages. And maybe you, Gabriel, know better than I. But certainly, we are all the time having to choose between speaking in the active voice or the, you know, the passive. Um, and most of the time, I favor the active. Mm-hmm. But if I'm trying to be generative, if I'm trying to go places I've never been before and, and access resources that are uh, in the subconscious or unconscious, um, the active voice can be a barrier. Mm-hmm. And it took me many years to to understand that. Uh, I don't know neurologically what... A, a, what the barrier looks like in mm-hmm. terms of synapses, but it's there. Mm-hmm. Um, if we can say with some of the great artists, uh, I am being possessed by this idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. that's passive voice expression. Right. Um, we can we can approach the state of mind we need to 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 get access. Uh, to, to, to the stuff that is not within conscious control, getting back to that word control. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Again, this is about generativity. That's what that whole section of, of the book mm-hmm. is about. It's not mm-hmm. to say you, you, you want to go through life passively, by no means. I still hold to what I, you know, tried to say earlier in the book. But, but this section you're turning to right now mm-hmm. is about generativity. And without some passivity in the mix, mm-hmm. or you might, perhaps a better word than passivity here is receptivity, mm-hmm. you can't really uh, do as much creation as you'd hope. That's what this section is yeah. about. Yeah, I felt I felt it like it was um, this whole thing that, you know, you mentioned like great artists and, and writers and so on, and a lot of them do have this sort of they talk about having this feeling that when they're creating something it's not they're just a vessel for the idea and it's doing it itself yeah that's right yeah and without getting into that space in the mind it's it's hard really to create as much or as much that's as true Mm -hmm. and the active always puts you in the way doesn't it it blocks this it does yeah 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 um yeah no i thought that was really cool um the dark unconscious you called it I, I liked that phrase. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. But yeah, and I wanted to take this opportunity to, because I just, I just find the pa- passive really fascinating. And, um, you know, you know, Grammarly, it's, um, it's, uh, online sort of grammar checker. Right. Yeah. And if you, if you write anything in the passive, it calls you out. <laughs> so That's it, it, it's weird. Yeah. It doesn't, it can't stand the passive at all. Um, I thought that was quite quite amusing. But we've also got, as you mentioned, Strunk and White and uh, George Orwell as well. Never right. use the passive when the active will do was the line, I think. Um, I might be paraphrasing. But yes, I, I that's was thinking... very close to what Orwell says. That was it, what yeah. What just said is very much like Orwell. Yes. That's, yeah, that's what I was trying to, trying to get. Um, but yeah, so but I was thinking about this. I saw a very interesting um, presentation at a, a conference, an English teachers conference, all on the passive. And it doesn't always it's not always fully reversible. Um, so the example that he gave was um, what was it? It was these seats must be oh, was it? smokers must occupy these seats. Yes. Right. So if you're a smoker, you have to occupy these seats. Um if you make it in the passive, it's a bit strange. Uh, these seats must be occupied by smokers. <laughs> and we have to go and find a smoker now and then put him in the seat quickly. It, it's strange, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but it, it, that doesn't, you're right, that doesn't reverse so well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, a lot of just, things. Mm-hmm, sorry. Yeah. No, no, let you think. 
didn't come in. That, that's right. Just because uh, smokers ha- should should use only those seats doesn't mean that those seats are only for smokers. Mm-hmm. So others others can choose to be sitting among smokers <laughs> if they want to be. <laughs> of course. And uh, we yeah. And yeah, we yeah. can't have the seats yeah, empty it either. It, it doesn't reverse, you're right. Yeah. So I thought that was that kind of made me really think, because, you know, and up until then I was like, yeah, the passive and the active, they just flip, right? But, and the, right. a lot of the time they do. But the, it has its own character. There's something under the surface going on there. It's, it, it's a cheeky a cheeky one, I think. Yes, you've given me something to mull now. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm a, new chapter, a new chapter. <laughs> on, the, on, on the irreversibility of some passives. Yes. Yeah. It's like dogs must be carried. I like that one too. <laughs> but that's not a, it, it's still weird in the active too. So yes. yeah, yeah. You must carry a dog. Um, moving, <laughs> moving on. Um, marks and modifiers that go missing and much more. Yes. Um, you had a, yeah, this, this really, I like this a lot because this is essentially all about pragmatics, isn't it? Um, like, it's about clarity. Mm, yeah. Being clear and, yeah. Um, a lot of our lack of clarity comes from just sort of um, from a sort of pragmatic rather than a, a, a actual language uh, element. You had the examples of a guy putting on a jacket and his wife saying, "Being in such bad shape, you shouldn't wear that jacket." Right. And him having a complex for the rest of the day <laughs> about his shape. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, tell me, tell me in your words, like how how do you feel that the ideas are uh, in this in this chapter and the point it's making? Well, that particular chapter, I enjoyed writing that chapter, mm-hmm. but it's the least. Uh, I would say it's the least original of my chapters because uh, it's it's uh, reworking territory that has been uh, well trod by Lynn Lynn Truss. You were mentioning. Mm-hmm. Uh, a bit ago, and Richard Letterer and many other mm-hmm. people. I think Crystal talks about this as well. He's got a whole uh, book on this, I think. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. You mean Urban Crystal? Uh, David Crystal. David Crystal. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, but yes, mm-hmm. there are all these ways that English trips us up if we're not careful. We need to put a modifier close to the thing it's modifying. Yeah. And uh, if we don't, uh, uh, we just invite confusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to be sure if we say, uh, he or she or they rather than name, mm-hmm. uh, people, it will be clear to a reader, given what, what else we've said, uh, who among the different people named in our piece of writing we have in mind at that point. That's called a pronoun reference. Uh huh. Right. So there are all these and 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 I give examples of how the omission of a mark of punctuation can have <laughs> enormous consequences. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I tried to include two or three instances of that in the chapter. This is a chapter about clarity. It's about and, clarity. And, yeah. and about clarity and the pitfalls, clarity yeah. and pitfalls to clarity. I'm I'm going to make a small counter as well, though. I think uh, sometimes yeah. lack of clarity can be great fun. Um, <laughs> I think it it can serve as a very strong bonding tool because you know if you if you yeah. have a a miscommunication that's quite funny, yes, um, you know this this quickly becomes an in joke and and you, you oh, become yes. closer to the to the person. Then it becomes part of your shared history. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember the I'm, time when? <laughs> yeah. I'm all- I'm over yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> and I think even a step further, um, like making things unclear is sometimes like a sort of Dadaist tool. You know, the, the way the Dadaist movement were absolutely absurd. And, but the whole purpose was to make you sort of consider and reconsider mm-hmm. meaning and, and look at things in a different way. So, I mean, yeah, in, in that spirit, you could also be deliberately obscure sometimes in order to get people thinking a little. Right. Yeah. Uh, there are, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the American uh, Declaration of Independence. I've heard uh, of it. <laughs> you've heard of it? <laughs> I, I'm vaguely aware of it. I, I think I can cite some of the stuff. Um, we the People. I, that's well, it. it's, it's, uh, it, We the People is actually, I believe it's what opens the preamble to the Constitution, uh-huh. I, if, if I'm correct. But in the Declaration of Independence, you, you get phrases like, 
all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. What is that supposed to mean? And yet, especially, what is it supposed to mean written at a time when there was slavery yeah. in America? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What what did it mean to the to the people who wrote it and then voted to adopt it? Uh, what 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 does it mean now, or should it mean? Mm -hmm. Obviously, in some respects, we're not all created equal. Mm -hmm. Some of us are missing a limb, and others of us uh, are are given um, uh, <laughs> mental capacities that outstrip our peers, and so forth and so on. What does it mean to say all men are created equal? And yet, in America. I mean, this is all to your point, by the way, mm -hmm, the use nice. of confusion. Mm -hmm. In America, we keep going back to that phrase. What should it mean today? Mm -hmm. And without its ambiguity, it would not have been as fruitful a piece of language as it's turned out to be. Uh -huh. it, it, its ambiguity has made it serviceable over and over again to expand um the world of equality, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so I think about that. I think about that function of confusion. It's it's not exactly what you're you're saying, but it's it's it it it, it, it it's a function. Yeah, it ties of, in. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's the same sort of thing, but for a different purpose, I suppose. Right. Mm, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Um, we also I've got some notes on just things that just are. So problematic in the, in the English language. Negative questions. How do you answer a negative question? Like, huh. didn't you see her? Is that a yes <laughs> or a no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's yeah. Yes. Then then you have you can't stop your answer just with yes or no. You have to say yes, I saw her. Yeah. If you want if you want to be sure you've been heard. And yeah. sometimes you end up with very sort of uh, strange sentences like yes, I didn't. Um, <laughs> which is great right. fun um, German actually has a word for this if the answer is negative no sorry if the answer is positive being the opposite of the negative question yes they have a word for this it's just for one word doch oh yeah and That's, my yeah yeah and my partner and I we, we use that we use that word we've integrated it because it's so useful it's ah. yeah makes things clearer uh -huh. yeah good to know yeah um, maybe maybe we should all try and in integrate that into English. It's a very yeah, useful I, word. How do you spell it? Doch. Uh, yeah, D O C H. Doch. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good yeah. to know. <laughs> Start slipping it into conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, chapter twelve: bonding, ellipses. Um, I think this is very very like it's a really related to the previous chapter in in many ways. I think um, you had. <laughs> I really liked one of the examples. Even my sister wanted to sign the get well card to Mrs. O'Hara. <laughs> so with this simple even, yes. you've, you've, you've transformed, you've, you've just created a whole new layer of meaning um, in this sentence. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, tell, tell me what you, you, you feel about this chapter and what, what, what the ideas are in it. Right. Uh, if you say even my sister wanted to sign the get well card, you are assuming a lot about your hearer or your or, or, or your reader uh, you're saying I know how close you and I are and how much you already understand about my family mm -hmm. uh, my sister uh, my sister's relationship with Mrs. O'Hara <laughs> <Yeah>. whatever <laughs> it may be that's how close we are mm -hmm. so we're both we're both conveying a piece of uh, in, in intelligence or information here and uh, celebrating or reinforcing our closeness. That's it. Yeah. And that's what that chapter is about. Yeah. When I when I was doing my master's, I, um, I, I remember really thinking about this for the first time, that language isn't a mere conveyor of information. It's a tool. Not, yes, it's a tool or a very social tool, I suppose, to, right. to bond and to, to relate to each other. Right. Not just information. Right. When I was reading about this, the writer was talking about he was on this bus and there, there were two, two, two women having this conversation behind him. And it was just um, they, they were sort of complaining about some guy. 
And they were just sort of saying the same thing at each other and then just responding and going, oh, I know, I know. And then like, da, 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 oh, I know, I know. And he's thinking, why are they having this conversation? <laughs> there's yes, no purpose. Right. It's yes. purely just a bond. It's, it's There's no yes. new information going on. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And uh, you have a quote uh, in in the chapter, the person who pays any attention to the syntax of things will never wholly kiss you. You're right. That's a great. That's E. E. Cummings, the poet. It wasn't. It was Cummings, wasn't it? Yeah. And read between the lines. I guess is my summary of this, um, this chapter. Uh huh. That's right. There's more to it. We are. We are doing, as you were saying, we are doing more Mm. than uh, communicating uh, data, information of different kinds. We are. Yes. We are saying. I know you, you know me, and I'm so pleased that that's so. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. isn't it interesting how, like, um, the better people know each other, the more ellipses they use. You have right. things like, because Jane, or uh, I'm going to do the thing. <laughs> it's, it's very, very bonding. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Yeah. I have a friend. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect her identity because <laughs> she sometimes gets um, a bit angry with waiters and waitresses. Um sometimes and <laughs> when i'm with her and we're, we're eating and maybe yeah. the waiter or waitress like does something that i know is going to set her off I'm, I'm always just like yeah don't, don't do the thing <laughs> <laughs> it's always just yeah. known as the thing because you know what that thing is yeah okay. we both know. <laughs> yeah that's yeah. right <laughs> don't do it don't do yeah. it <laughs> i have to call her out on that <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah no I, I really enjoyed that one um chapter 16 uh, uh-huh. To compromise, but not be compromised. They made singular. Right. Yeah, this was uh, this was an interesting one. I I think my main note about this was this is basically we're looking at a prescriptivist versus descriptivist sort of angle here. Or at least that's an ingredient in this yes. in this chapter, and that that debate's always fun. That's but, right. Yeah, tell tell me about the chapter and and the ideas in this one. Yeah. Well, I didn't go into this in in the actual text of the chapter, but while I was uh, writing that chapter, um, I I was uh, in communication with a young person I've known for a a long time who was making a transition Mm -hmm. from being a a man to a woman. Mm -hmm. And... uh, for a period of time, it, it was asking to be, you know, referred to as they, mm-hmm. and and I was doing that. I I wanted to honor that that request, but at the same time in my mind, I was regretting the choice of they, mm-hmm. <laughs> partly because uh, there's it, it, to my and, and I discuss this in other chapters in the book, mm-hmm. not this particular chapter. Partly because in my mind. In our society today, there's been too much blending of the individual with the whole hmm. and assuming that we are like each other, uh, glossing over uh, the peculiarities, one unique individual to the next. Mm-hmm. So then to take our primary uh, pronoun for, for plural and mm-hmm. slap it on top of an individual uh, seemed to me like a further way of uh, uh, blurring mm-hmm. uh, those individual distinctions. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that, that was the most troublesome part of the choice of they for me. Mm-hmm. I wanted to honor the decision about the word they, but I found myself uh, wishing there were something better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that was part of the impetus there. Yeah. yeah, it's a really fascinating take because you're you're going from the sort of point of view of that um, it it sort of it does a disservice to the person you're using it uh, using it to refer or you're referring to because it's homogenizing their identity with with everybody else's. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and but I know it's become a very popular way of mm-hmm. referring. And, 
Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a fast, fascinating area of modern ling- linguistics at the moment, isn't it? Where it becomes very right. sociopolitical, sociolinguistic sort of area. And even people right. have been working on alternatives and are using alternatives as well. Right. I don't yeah. think any alternative has caught on the way they yeah. has. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems that they, because we have, I guess we've been using it already before uh, gender politics was, was right. part of this uh, discussion, you know, like as when we just don't know who... Who yeah, yeah, someone was. You're absolutely right. This this particular use of they actually goes back a long, long time. <laughs> and so you could say it's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can make that argument if you like. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I I see what you mean as well. You make a point about um, not like avoiding thoughtless echoing as well, and just really thinking about your own language. That's right. Well. Yeah, I still feel long. I, I I felt that the all all the other alternatives um, were all a bit clunky. He she or yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and they, also they, doesn't yeah. go ahead sorry. and just also um, they a lot of them didn't address like any sort of when somebody doesn't identify as either as well. Right. That's right. Yeah. But there were that's there right. were others. There were things like using um using their name instead yeah. for. Every time, yes, yes. Ooh, can I remember the others? And um, using like their position or their job, like the carpenter. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I know. But the, 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 the language is in flux. It's always mm-hmm. been in flux, mm-hmm. and it's certainly in flux about this right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I tried to use that as a way of talking about compromise in yeah. life. Yeah. That this is this can be a model for. Dealing with all sorts of compromise Mm -hmm. that we make in the course of life to get on with life. Um, it's, it's dicey. Yeah. It's always going to be like that. And yeah, yeah, language change is turbulent. Right. Yeah. 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 But yeah, moving on. Um, I want to make a note because the next, you you sort of collect your chapters in, um, in sort of broad categories. And the next one was grammar for freedom. And I, I really enjoy sort of thinking about it in that sort of way. Um, language can really keep us in our place and, and uh, like under the boot and prevent right. us from, from being free. And this is when I was going to bring up Orwell's uh, politics and, and the English okay. language, because this is doublespeak, isn't it? When this is the purpose of doublespeak in 1984. Uh, I, I think doublespeak uh, 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 was uh, to, uh, to obscure reality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, language also operates to reify it, to uh, freeze it, mm-hmm. to make it, uh, to make the reality of one moment endure long past the time when it should. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I give different examples of how we do this with language. Uh, I was so happy to find that the illustration that you see in the book, mm-hmm. uh, the German artist George Rose, man being strangled by a giant paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even with our names, mm-hmm. what does it mean to have to go through life with the same name, mm-hmm. day after day, year after year, even as you are changing. Mm-hmm. The name used to represent one thing in other people's minds, their understanding of uh, you from a snapshot of you, mm-hmm. the little they know of you, when when you were whatever you were at that moment, mm-hmm. were doing whatever you were doing then. But the name endures, and the associations that the attached to the name at, at, at that moment endure. And uh, so you walk into or through a world of expectations about you just by having a name. Yeah. And I talk a little about names in that section of the book, too. Mm-hmm. But I, I get into other matters, how the choice of tense either uh, uh, keeps you in your place mm-hmm. uh, in the minds of others, at least, or opens up the space to be something different. That's what that whole section is about. Yeah, yeah, and I, it was it was it was strongly made these points. 
the sort of way that language can be a cage uh, for us. Yes. Like the right. image. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I want to talk about that past tense uh, chapter because that was that was really cool. And you know, I I never really really thought about it before. This is something completely new to me. But uh -huh. well, you go ahead. Yeah, t tell us about that one. It's the other false equate. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Other other false equations using e prime in the past tense. Well, in the we sometimes trap ourselves just by using present tense mm -hmm. uh, if we say uh, I you know I, I, I don't I don't get on with that kind of person mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a present tense piece of expression mm -hmm. um, it, it, whereas I might have said I had I had trouble seeing eye to eye with her mm -hmm. or getting on the same page with him Mm -hmm. uh, when you, well, actually, the example I I just gave is not just about the difference in tense; it's also about moving from the specific to the general. I was generalizing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but say uh, in sports, uh, if I don't do well at the free throw line in basketball, I, I don't even know whether basketball is a popular game in the UK. Is it? Um, really it is fairly popular, but you know what? It was one of the only sports I enjoyed when I was a kid. So, oh, okay, yeah, so I played I, it. I, yeah. Okay, good. You're giving me license to continue. Here. <laughs> so if if uh, uh, I have been in a in a game of basketball and missed all my 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 shots, my free my free shots at the basket, uh, I could say I. I could just be factual about it and speak in the past tense and say, I didn't make a single one of my shots today. Yeah. Or I could say, I don't do well at, at, at that. And that's in the present tense. Mm -hmm. And once you speak in the present tense, you're almost defining yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, even though the present tense is supposed to be a thing that passes into the past, a piece of present tense expression uh, tends to to say this is uh, an ongoing or enduring feature of mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. That's what I try to get at yeah. about the choice of tenses. It's it's this, you can sort of if you use this tense, um, learners often call it the present simple tense. Um, I don't know if it's the same in the states, but. Um, yeah, if you use this tense, um, you're sort of damning yourself, aren't you, to to always be like that? Right. Yeah. As yeah. we sit here, I realize I'm, I may not be taking as much care as I should here, mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes what's also at work is the difference between being specific and, and generalizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to think harder about that, and that's coming out just right now between us. That's great. New book. I'm, not, I'm going to have to go back to the book and see how careful I was or was not making that <laughs> distinction. But please, yeah, let's go on. No, fair point, fair point. Um, yeah, let's move, move on to another chapter. Um, uh, taking ownership with a grain of salt, the possessive pronouns. Yes. Um, yes, this whole idea that the genitive, you know, my or, or his or your, um, can sort of enforce ownership of things. Right. Perhaps unreasonably i think was was the point um right. and yeah try i, I love you i love your suggestions you you have the example of your money or your life and yes. perhaps it should be the money or your life because when, it's, right. when it's the money right. you're you have less problem parting with it rather than your money yes i think so yeah no, no. I, I felt that very strongly yeah yeah and the, your examples were great like try de-owning things um Instead of saying my clothes, the, the clothes you see me in at work. I think that was great. <laughs> right. Yes, right. <laughs> and um, my house, nah, the house where I live. Yes. Yeah. But and of course, people people do say that. You do hear people say the house where I live rather than my house. Mm -hmm. And I I can't be sure, but I think the people who put it that way are not as confused about the difference between themselves and their so-called possessions as the rest of us. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. 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 
it's good. I mean, you know, we live in an age where people are very attached to material stuff. So it's right. a hel- I think it's very healthy advice. And it reminds me that when I was like a teenager, no, in my 20s, um, I went on a walk with my parents. Um, and you can, you can walk across London. Uh, we've started in the west suburbs of London. And you can go all the way to the center without crossing a single road if you go along the canal. There's a, there's oh. a canal going right through the city. A few, in fact. And, um, so we took this walk. It was fantastic. It was about four hours long. And, um, during that walk, my dad told me about what, um, some Australian, um, uh, Aboriginal tribes, uh, or oh, the have. walkabout. The well, it's walkabout. Not, not quite, it's probably related to the walkabout, but they have this, um, idea that wherever you've walked, you own it. So, it's yours now because oh. you've walked there and yeah. it's so simple but it's so beautiful and yes, it reminds right. yeah well your chapter okay. totally reminded me of that oh nice to hear yeah so okay. yeah my me and my family we have we have a whole whole section of london <laughs> oh. <laughs> <In> our ownership <laughs> but it, obviously there's a difference here between like personal ownership and collective ownership obviously that's what right. they're, they're getting right. at right. Right. um yeah uh, just one more um I wanted to discuss a hedge against preoccupation, the future tense and adverbial phrase, uh, pro, pro, provisos. Yes, provisos. <laughs> I keep wanting to say provisios. It's just uh, yeah, pro- totally off track. I love the future tense. I find the future tense fascinating. I, I was planning at one point doing a whole podcast episode just on the future because the more you dig, the weirder it gets. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, tell tell us about this idea in 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 this chapter um, about the future because this is something I'm very guilty of. Well, it's that that particular chapter is in a section about mindfulness, mm-hmm. uh, about the ways language either enables us to be alert to life as it unfolds in real time, or gets in the way of that level of attentiveness. Um, if we make our plans with too much uh, <laughs> conviction, too much definiteness, we are liable to go through life until those plans are executed at, at the very least, uh, not seeing a lot that's unfolding in our midst. Uh, so we have linguistic means or what you might call an escape hatch here. Mm-hmm. So long as we keep telling ourselves, you know, God willing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or if the mule don't sick and die, or <laughs> all things, or all things being equal, so long as we we work into our discourse and especially into our internal monologic discourse, uh, these reminders that life goes on regardless our commitments. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to miss a lot of it if we're too fastened to the commitment. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, may, it, it, it makes a difference. The, lingu- yeah. the, 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 ling- the, ling- the linguistic side of it makes a difference. That's what I'm trying to get into in, that, in, yeah. in the different aspects of that in that chapter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You've got to give yourself a break, I think. When you, when you do, by doing this, you know, like, um, yeah. I'm so guilty of this because, you know, I, I'm very headstrong and when I make a plan, it's like, it has to happen and I right. do not rest until it's, it's been executed. Right. But, right. but yeah, I should stop and look around. Was that Ferris, <laughs> Bueller, Ferris Bueller's Day, Day Off? You, you remember well, that film? That, that's a wonderful film. That was, was that line, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you might miss it. That's right. Man, yeah. That's, yeah. It's about your chapter. <laughs> um, yes. But yes, the future. Let's talk a little bit about the future because you you notice uh, you notice you you point out that um, will is actually uh, really means want uh, right. from the German ich will and you know to right. be willing or, or to have the will to do something. And right. one thing I I really find interesting about the future is that you know we famously don't have a future tense, but you know we talk about the future. But the more certain the future we're using, the more presenty it becomes. Um, oh, help me with that. Yeah, okay, so you've got like will, right? And actually your yeah. examples, will's also weird because will's usually weak, 
but in the examples you're giving that it's actually very strong you know i will go to the wall um yeah. Yeah. but usually it's very weak it's you know i'll, I'll get it or I'll, I'll come along you know it's it's very okay. unintended sort of will a very unplanned will spontaneous okay. when we talk about um plans we usually use something like um you know i'm going to like uh-huh. yeah not always and you know yeah english okay. is very very versatile but generally speaking so you know i'm going to this is a present tense right and if you want to make it more sort of certain Instead of saying, you know, I, I'm going to meet them at seven o'clock, you say, I'm meeting them at seven o'clock. You bring it further ah. to the present and it becomes more certain. Isn't and that interesting? It's crazy. And one more step further, you, if for like scheduled events, you have things, you know, like the, the concert starts at seven o'clock and you're using this even more presenty <laughs> sort of tense and it becomes even more certain. So it's like we're drawing it closer to us with this. With, that with is the fascinating. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. Now I have to call back all the copies <laughs> printed of the book. But no, <laughs> it doesn't contradict <laughs> your... Well, I'm going to have to it. take one copy at a time and rewrite <laughs> that section. <laughs> Welcome. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it crazy, though? Like <laughs> that's that's yeah. You're really calling my attention to something I had not <laughs> considered. Oh, I'm, I'm really pleased. Well, you've done that a lot with the book <laughs> in general. So, yeah, I really appreciate, appreciate that. Um there is a study. Um, no, I'm going to I'm going to talk about this later because it's in the after part. Um, so yeah, those were the chapters that I, I particularly enjoyed, and I had like most sort of thoughts from. Um, but would you, if you, are you okay for time? Because we're we're an hour in. I'm I'm okay. I'm a, I'm a little short for it now, okay. but yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> but go ahead. We'll whiz through this part uh, pretty quick. Yeah. So uh, this is sort of idea about language controlling us and us controlling language and yeah. which way does it go you know we have uh, the warfian hypothesis i think it is um right which is okay. not not so popular these days but this idea that um right. the language we use affects our cognitive like the way our brain works right but then um do you know about dan everett he's a field linguist yes yes you know, i know some about dan everett yeah. dan everett Became the dean at, at Bentley University, where oh, I spent of course. some 20, 25 or more years teaching. Yeah. Did you meet him? Uh, no, he came in just as I was leaving. Ah, bad timing. <laughs> but I, I, I learned about him at that time. My, and, I, and, I know, and I know that, but you go ahead. You're making no, no, a point. Go on, go on, go on. No, 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 please. Okay. Um, well, I just want to say, like, he he says something that's kind of sort of the opposite. Um, but yeah. it's a beautiful line of his. I hope I'm not not messing it up. Uh, the language is exactly what the culture needs it to be. Uh-huh. I love that line so much. So uh-huh. we we control language. Language doesn't control us, according to this. I mean, I'm simplifying it horrendously, and I'm sure he'd he'd take an issue with the way I'm putting this. But um, I like the spirit of it and the this idea that. It's within our, we have the agency with language. It doesn't tell us what to do. Yes, yes. I, I agree. Um, <clears throat> Benjamin Lee Worf, you were talking about the Worfian mm-hmm. Sapir hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's a very powerful hypothesis mm-hmm. that language not only helps us to express our thought, it somewhat molds our thought. Mm -hmm. Now, it has come into disrepute. Other linguists have demonstrated that it it doesn't operate to mold thought unless it's consonant, unless it's in line with uh, other other factors, including cultural factors, Mm -hmm. Uh, getting to what Dan Everett was writing about. But one thing I try to say in the introduction is that intention is itself a fact. If I adopt a new way of speaking and I do it with intention, I want this new uh, habit of mine to work itself on me as a person and enlarge me then it really might happen and does mm-hmm. often happen. 
Mm-hmm. Intention is itself a force, and, and and can be as as strong a force as external cultural matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, so yes, it works both ways. You yeah. were saying, this, yeah, absolutely. Intention it it, it it means a great deal here if if you're after um, actualizing your you know whole best self. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. I, uh, I don't want to add to that because that, that, that caps everything off absolutely, like, perfectly. And I think summarizes some of the, at least some of the spirit of the book, I think, right there. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, that was great. Um, so one more time, I'm going to mention the book, um, strongly recommended, <laughs> Grammar for a Full Life, How the Ways We Shape a Sentence Can Limit or Enlarge Us. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I would like to add my thanks to you. I've enjoyed this so much. I've learned so much from you. (laughs) Me too, me too from you. I really enjoyed it. Yes, thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Okay, and that was it. That was my chat with Larry. Uh, What a nice guy. And what an insightful man. So, yeah, that that, that got very abstract. It got very philosophical. We looked at some interesting areas like sociolinguistics and even George Orwell and even a man being strangled by a giant paragraph. I think that was my favorite bit. But yeah, so um, that was great. If you have any comments, there were lots of interesting topics that came up and some even controversial ones, uh, at least one I can think of. So if you have any input, uh, anything you want to say about uh, any of the issues we talked about today, then uh, just send an email to gabriel at clarkandmiller.com. Also, um, remember the quiz. If you want to win a free copy of our ebook, 102 Little Drawings That Will Help You Remember English Rules Forever, uh, then save yourself 10 bucks. You can win uh, the competition and send me an email with your answer to the question, what are your favorite listening strategies? How do you practice listening uh, English or another language that you're learning? I will award a free copy of the book to what i think is the best answer i am the judge jury and executioner of this quiz so yeah gabriel at clarkandmiller.com any queries ideas complaints abuse maybe not abuse polite abuse please or the answer to the quiz i am looking forward to hearing from you meanwhile uh, have a great day week weekend month year decade century what whatever time perspective you like looking at things in and uh i will see you virtually next time